About a month ago, I showed you guys a project where I 3D printed a speaker adapter on my new Robo R2 3D printer. Printing that speaker adapter got me to thinking, how far can I push this printer and what would it take to print a larger project? Would it be possible to print an amplifier rack? In this video, I'm going to be testing a proof of concept and taking you guys through the process of designing and printing this large scale project. An amplifier rack that includes mounting flanges, wire routing passages, integrated cooling fans, and more. Let's get into it. To start the design process, I'm going to need a sheet of paper, a ruler, and then of course my amplifiers that I'm actually going to be measuring. I'm taking several different measurements of the amplifiers, including the width of the amplifier, the depth, and the height. After I get each of these measurements, I record it onto my piece of paper. The pieces we are making are meant to mount the amplifiers, so I also need to know the mounting pattern. I measure between each of the holes from side to side and from front to back, and then I also measure the distance of the hole from the edge of the amplifier. I've recorded all these values and I've also included a dimension that allows me to know how much room I need to leave exposed in order to have access to all of these controls. I also want to mount both amplifiers in a way that minimizes their footprint. In other words, I'm going to have to mount the amplifiers in an angled fashion like this. And since one of these amplifiers will be mounted above the other in this sort of fashion, I don't want all these wires coming out over the amplifier. I want to be able to run them to the side. So I want some sort of wire trough for all those wires to sit inside of. Finally, on the back side of each of these amplifiers, I want to include a fan mount. So after spending some time modeling, here is what I have come up with. Now this isn't meant to be a modeling tutorial, but there are plenty of different 3D programs that you can use. In this case, I'm using Autodesk Fusion 360. Since I have all my different measurements for the amplifiers, I started with modeling those. You can see that each amplifier has two support pieces. The bottom support on each amplifier is what I call the cross trough, and you can see that I've designed it in a way that wiring can go up inside of it, or it also has this L shape here so that the wiring will be held. Next we have what I call the cross fan piece. This piece also picks up the mounting locations from the amplifier, but you can see on the back side here, we have a built-in fan. This fan will blow air up against the amplifier and you can see it has this cooling passage. All four of these support pieces are held together by these vertical side plates. The side plates are designed in two different pieces, that way I can print them on the printer. They will be bolted together here. And you can see that this bottom plate also allows for some wire pass through and it also has the integrated angles built in to display these amplifiers in an angled manner. Cross supports are supported by these four different mounting locations. And then these bolts on the bottom allow us to bolt down the final assembly. Now for each of these components, once I'm satisfied with the final design, what I can do is I can click that component in the tree and I can go to save as STL. An STL file is a 3D solid file and I can now open it in my slicer software. There are many different slicers to use and what a slicer does is it basically determines how to actually make this part on the printer. Now in this case, I don't wanna print in this orientation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to orient that bottom part against the build plate and then I will center the part and the reason I oriented the part that way is I'll be able to print this part without any support material. Just to give you guys an idea, if I did orient it this way, as you can imagine, once it got to this layer, it would close this layer off. And that means once it gets up to this layer here, where it's printing the underside of this, there's not going to be any material underneath it to support it. You would either have to print with support material or you would have to have your printer print in a bridging setting where basically the printer head moves quickly from this location to this location to create a bridge and then fill it in. Bridging is possible and we can get good results on the Robo 3D R2, but in this case, because this part fits easily on its side, I'm just going to keep it in that orientation. I can now click edit process settings. In here, I have a bunch of different options for how I can actually print this. I can choose the material that I'm going to be using, the different layers and speeds, etc. Once I'm satisfied with all my settings, I can go to prepare to print. Here, I'm going to get an idea what the printer is actually going to do layer by layer. Now I wanna give you guys an inside look of kind of what's going on with the printing process here. You can see that we start with our bottom three layers, which will be completely solid. And then we start to do what's called an infill material. I'll show you guys this while we're actually printing. That infill material then gets capped off for another three layers, and then it'll start to build up this part of the angle. If you're new to 3D printing, I recommend that you take a closer look at this layer type view and get an idea what the printer is actually doing, especially at locations like this, where it's capping off the top of this bolt hole. 
This is a perfect example of where we would require bridging. There's no support material underneath here, but if I go one layer up, you can see that the layers connect immediately with each other, and then it fills in between that bridge, so it won't be a problem to print this. I'm satisfied with the way everything looks here, so the final move is I'm going to save my toolpath to disk as G-code. Now that I have my G-code file, I've logged into the Robo web interface. And from here, I can control all of the different aspects of the machine. I will drop in my G-code file, wait for it to upload. And now that it's uploaded into the queue here, I can load it. And I could actually start printing here from the browser, but instead let's go over to the 3D printer. To get started with printing our project here, we need our material. In this case, I'm gonna be using ABS filament. I have some white filament and I also have some red. I'm using ABS because of its resistance to higher temperatures. I'm going to start with printing the white part, so I need to load my white filament. The Robo R2 has a whole wizard for this. I've already pushed the filament through this tube and then what I can do is hit next. The extruder will start running and I'll just push this into here. And now we wait for material to start coming out of the nozzle. There we go, we've got material coming out so I can go ahead and hit next. And now we are ready for printing. Now that I've transferred the file via Wi-Fi to the printer, I can hit files, local storage. There it is right there, side plate, right side. Let's go ahead and start printing. Before the printer starts printing, it's going to run through an auto leveling routine, which allows the machine to perform calculations and make sure that it prints perfectly level. This is the sign of a good machine so that when it does start printing, like it's about to do, it will make sure that that first layer has a great adhesion to the heat bed and that everything is nice and even. So the first thing the printer is doing here is it's applying the first layer to the heated bed. And we are now about an hour into the print and you can see that we're starting to print the infill material in this hexagon pattern. Quick update here, you can see the printer has now got to the point that it's starting to cap off the infill areas because this surface here is going to obviously be closed off and a surface, an exterior surface of the part. And now the printer has finished capping off this top surface and you can see that it's also built up the angled part of our vertical bracket here and it's actually putting the finishing touches on right now. Here comes the finished part. Here we have our first finished piece so this is the angled bracket that will obviously sit vertically and it will hold the angled supports that go across that the amplifier mounts to. This particular print took about four hours to make and just for the sake of time in this video we're going to go through making some of the other components pretty quickly. And here's our next part complete. This time it's just a mirror image of the first part we printed. Let's keep printing these parts. I'll go to files, local storage. Here it is right here. We're going to do the next top plate that mates to that part. Here we have our next vertical support piece. This piece will mount on top of the base piece like that. So now we can print the mirror copy of that. And here is our mirror piece. Look at the main supports here. I'm now going to switch to printing with red filament. So here we have another piece complete. This particular piece is the fan housing bracket. You'll notice that the part was in this orientation and I was actually able to completely print this circle here without any support material. You can see the top of it is just a little rough, but I can easily clean this up by just heating it up slightly with a heat gun. Here's our next piece. This piece also goes across and supports the amplifier. And like we talked about during the design process, you can see it has this ledge here that will support the wiring that goes into the amplifier. So I now have all of my different components printed and ready for assembly. In order to actually assemble all of these components, I need a variety of different fasteners. The specialized fastener that I'm going to need are these right here. These are heat set inserts. I'll put a link to all the different stuff that I used, including the fans and the heat set inserts down in the video description. So I take a soldering iron and I hold the tip of it against the insert. Once the insert is almost completely down in the hole, I push it in flush using a metal pry tool. I repeat this process several more times until I've added these four on these two support pieces. To secure the two together, I'm using a 1024 fastener, which goes through the top piece and then screws down into the bottom insert. And with that, my two vertical supports for this amplifier rack are now completely assembled. On these pieces that connect to the amplifier, I'm going to be using slightly smaller threaded inserts. These are eight by 32 inserts, and they're gonna go in these four locations for the corners of the amp and on the sides of these pieces I'm once again going to be using those same 1024 sizes that I used on the vertical supports. Also on the back side of the fan piece are four locations for the 832s that will hold 
our cooling fan. I've got all the inserts added now. Here, just as an example, is the fan cross piece. We have the two that hold the amplifier on this side. Then we have these fasteners that hold to the vertical supports. And then finally, we have the fan bracket supports. I'm going to assemble the cooling fan to the fan bracket, and here you can see what that looks like. And then I'm going to finish the assembly by mounting all the cross pieces between the two vertical supports. Got the bottom row of the amplifier rack built here, so now I need to add the first amplifier. One amplifier down and one to go. Here we have it, the final assembly is complete. Now guys, I have to be honest, I am actually pretty impressed with the way this went. I mean, the whole point of this video was just to do kind of a proof of concept, can I actually build an amplifier rack with a 3D printer? And I would say this turned out pretty awesome. All of the tolerancing worked out perfectly. The holes actually matched up perfectly, which is good because there were a lot of different dimensions and angles in effect here. And if you try to shake this thing, I mean, it's, it's a solid one piece assembly. Now something else we definitely have to take a look at here are the cooling fans. I currently have them hooked up to a small little 12 volt power supply, so they are running. With the air passage here, there's actually a good amount of air coming out of there. Hard to obviously visualize on video, but if I put this tissue on here, you can see it has no problem keeping it afloat there as it blows air over all the different cooling fins on these amplifiers. Now I have a few more things that I wanna to touch on, but before we do that, question of the episode, if you had a 3D printer, what would you use it for? And what do you think would be cool to see printed on a 3D printer for car audio? Now there's a few different questions that I know are going to come up. First of all, how much total print time? This took a total of about 28 hours to print. And the comparison I would make is that if you are designing your own parts and if you had to send them out to another shop to be machined or otherwise produced, it's going to take a lot longer than that time if you have access to your own 3D printer. Now what if you run a car audio shop? In my opinion, you could design parts that match the amplifiers that you sell and you could easily be printing those in your off time. Keep in mind that even if a part takes something like five hours to print, you really only have to interact with the machine for like five minutes. You're just going to get it started, you're going to let it do its thing and you can be off working on other things and once it's done you remove the part, close the door and start the next one. Now could you make these pieces with traditional fabrication techniques? Of course you could. There's always more than one way to tackle a project but what I think is important to remember is once I have my initial design, I can literally just hit print and walk away from the printer and come back to a finished part. I don't have to spend a lot of hands-on time fabricating that part. If you have a 3D printer or if you want to take a look at some of the 3D files, I've dropped a link to them down in the video description. I also want to mention that the Robo R2 has been running great. I printed this whole project with zero issues. In fact, since I've got this machine, I really haven't had any troubles at all. If you'd like to learn more about the Robo R2, I would definitely recommend it and you can check it out down in the video description. If you're new here, check out some of my other 3D printing videos here on screen. I also do car audio review videos and build blog videos and I just love helping you guys learn how to design, build, and install your dream car audio system. As always my friends, thank you for watching.